Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second webinar in our patient and family engagement series. Today's topic is volunteer management part two, orientation, PFA retention strategies, and recognition options. My name is Jill Lindwall. I am a clinical quality improvement advisor at the Wisconsin Hospital Association, and I'll be coordinating today's event. For those of you not familiar with this technology, we are using a web-based video conferencing platform called Zoom. As of now, all of your mics are muted and all of your video feeds are active, meaning if you have a web camera attached, it may be on. This is meant to be an interactive event. When you would like to say something, please unmute your line by clicking on the little mic icon at the bottom left of your screen. And when you're done, go ahead and mute it again by clicking on the icon. You can also ask questions by submitting them in the chat box. This event is being recorded and will be available for access in the Quality Center. Let me now go ahead and introduce you to our presenter for today, Jenna Wright. As a program manager for patient and family advisor partnerships at UW Health, Jenna has gained extensive experience engaging patients and families in improvement work at a large academic medical system. She came into this role in 2017 with over 20 years of experience in adult education, training in academic and business environments, focusing on spoken and written communication. Her passions include health literacy, human connections and healthcare, and patient and family engagement in all aspects of healthcare design and delivery. Welcome, Jenna. Thanks, Jill. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for joining us today for the um, webinar. I appreciate that, that introduction. And thanks to the Wisconsin Hospital Association for hosting the webinar today. Um, so like Jill said, this is part two of our um, series on volunteer management for patient family advisors. And I'll kind of go through the, a little bit of the content of um, Yep, the last one um, on in May, we talked about recruitment, screening, and interviewing, as well as database management. And today we'll focus more on the orientation and placement um, plans that UW Health uh, uses and also our retention strategies and ways to recognize advisors for their contributions. And then there are two more in the series. There's one in September on um, building and sustaining organizational demand for PFA engagement. In September, we'll focus on internal marketing as well as project development. And then in November, we'll look at um, how to support staff and sharing outcomes and appreciation, which can um, drive future engagement with the program. Okay, so a little bit about UW Health. If you're not familiar, we are a large academic um, health system with um, several hospitals, um, clinics, and a, a large um, patient population of 600,000 patients. Um, so we've We've kind of grown a lot in the last few years, and with that growth, we've also added um, many advisors. We have 200 patient family advisors serving um, on, a, on an annual basis, and they serve in 12 councils and over uh, between 80 and 100 um, active committees or projects annually. Most of the work that I supervise or coordinate is in the Madison area, although there are things happening in other parts of our operations. Um, so if you were attending the last webinar, you did see this slide I just want to review because we're jumping in the middle of our PFA onboarding that um, when a new advisor uh, approaches us or is interested in the program, we review their application. There's a brief phone screening interview just to get to know the individual and make sure that it's a good fit and that we have a shared understanding of the role. And then um, we do a review by patient relations for any contact with the organization that would show um, any risk to the organization. Uh, we also do a background check for some, but not all positions. The positions that require a background check include those um, that have contact with patients and also those of a highly sensitive business nature. And today what we'll talk about um, that's part of this onboarding plan is orientation. Um, and if any of you are interested, it also includes HIPAA expectations because that's a fear that some people have um, that they're putting their organization at risk. So we'll talk about that. And then um, placement, um, the decisions that um, lead to the correct placement of a patient family advisor. And then after they're placed, um, they really do kind of leave my purview for a while and they continue their onboarding with the staff um, partner who's supervising their work directly. 
Sometimes it's me, but not always. Okay, so orientation for um, the patient family advisors is usually one-on-one -on -one in my case. Um, I get anywhere from, I don't know, three to five new patient family advisors per month. And I like to get to know them individually because um, their individual gifts and strengths, um, I need to know them well enough to know where to place them. So I usually have a nice long one hour meeting with them so I can get to know them. Um, Sometimes if it's a group, like if we're onboarding a whole advisory council at the same time, we will orient them all together. So we did this, for example, um, we did a startup for our neonatal intensive care unit group and we did all their orientation at the same day because they were all together in the same group. But usually if it's an established group, we're adding one at a time and we'll just do it one by one. Um, what, what we don't do, and some organizations might consider this, is we don't send our patient family advisors to general volunteer orientation, which covers a lot of content that they don't need to know. Um, so we just kind of customize it directly to the experience that they're going to have with us in a one hour orientation. So the content that um, I'll kind of preview some of that with you today is our course overview of the organization, what the, um, the purpose of the advisory program is and some of the activities that they can choose from, some tips on how to be an effective advisor and the benefits and responsibilities of the role. So the following slides are kind of directly from my slide deck for orientation. Um, this one here, you know, I like to define it really clearly for them. What is the patient family advisory program? So uh, the, this statement that was actually written by advisors um, defines the program from their view, which is working as partners, UW Health and patient family advisors seek to transform healthcare delivery by providing a forum for the patients and families' voices to be heard and understood. So for that, I, I like to clarify that the purpose of the program is for advisors to give staff advice and not for, for example, advisors to guide other patients through their healthcare journeys. We usually get, we, uh, we usually understand that before we get to the point of orientation, but here's another chance to um, reinforce that. Um, and then in my mind, as I may have said in the last webinar, I think about um, the purpose of the program in my world as, you know, patients are really stakeholders in many decisions that affect patient experience, quality, and safety of care. And so that's kind of the business language and the language that I think about it in. But if I try to use that language with patients, it doesn't quite resonate as well. So um, just simple, like we want to keep patients' voices in as many decisions as possible. And we set it up in lots of different ways. There are um, six major types of activities that facilitate that. And I'll talk about some of those um, later. But the main idea is to get voice, patients' voices in decisions that affect them. Um, this is also from orientation, so I, I like to, you know, right away acknowledge the value that patient family advisors bring, that they, um, you know, they offer that fresh perspective of generally a non-healthcare background, and if they have a healthcare background, they're not disqualified from participating, but I want them to take off their hat of, I'm also a nurse, or I'm also, um, you know, in a, in a clinical role of some sort. So I want them to bring that fresh perspective of what it feels like for certain things as patients. Um, and keeping that human side of healthcare present in all decisions. They definitely bring that. Um, we hear all kinds of um, ways that what, how they receive healthcare impacts their emotions, and we want to hear that um, as often as possible. And then I, I believe the greatest value that patient family advisors bring to a large organization like ours is that they see how we work together better than we know how we work together. Um, so they can kind of see that continuum of care and share that back with us which can help us improve. So I like to start off the orientation with really acknowledging the value that advisors offer. And um, this gives them a little bit of guidance about how they can contribute. So they know um, that they don't have to disagree with us, that they can definitely um, share with us their entire um, experience so we can make improvements based on that. Um, I also like to be really clear about about what isn't included in the role. So um, patient family advisors um, should not advance, their primary purpose should not be to advance personal agendas. Um, and we are trying instead to improve, um, make improvements that affect all patients. So that being said, sometimes people do have situations that were um, maybe that they want to get resolved. And so I try to direct them to the right resources for that. Um, so if they have something where it was a performance issue or um, something that affected them personally, Right away, you know, they should know that they can go to our patient relations department, but bringing those things up at meetings isn't really appropriate because 
meeting facilitator cannot solve those problems, doesn't have access to the records, and so on. So I like to be really clear about that. But then, at the same time, um, sometimes in meetings, uh, there might be a question like, well, tell us about an example when you had a negative experience. And at that point, it's totally okay for them to share that, um, that experience, as long as it's not for the purpose of getting a resolution. So also, we try to begin to orient them towards a systems focus instead of um, you know, criticizing individual performance issues. So, um, you know, the idea that we're here for improvements and improvements start with root causes and that kind of thing, we start to focus on that a little bit. And so um, a little orientation to that idea. And also, of course, we don't want PFAs to agree with us completely on everything. Um, we definitely don't want just a sounding board of yeses. We want to hear from their experiences and, um, you know, really how they respond to those um, ideas that we're bringing up. So I try to be super clear about um, what the expectation is. And um, generally, we don't have problems, but if we do, I have at least something to go back to, um, to say, you know, hey, let's make sure we're staying on track for the purpose of this meeting and not your own um, agenda or whatnot. Um, similarly, um, we encourage patient family advisors to speak up at meetings. Um, we don't want people to um, assume that what one person said, even, even if they agree with it, that what one person said could speak for all. Um, so even if they just chime in with agreement or, um, of course, they can, they can offer dissent in a respectful way. So they can say, you know, that wasn't my experience or I've, I do see things a different way. And I try to give them little sentence stems, um, you know, like, like I just said, to um, give them the, the way to say that. And again, we haven't had a lot of problems with this, but it's good to just start off on the right foot for setting expectations. Um, this can be a little bit of a challenge, but I like to warn people ahead of time during orientation, like every meeting has an agenda and there's usually a time limit for different um, parts of that agenda. And some people come from business backgrounds where this might be something that they're used to. And some people don't come from business backgrounds and might wanna um, contribute long personal narratives. And if you're listening and you're nodding your head, you know what I'm talking about. And so I try to like give them a little heads up like that, like monitor your own time and contribution. And it's perfectly okay to say, you know, I want to talk about this, but maybe after the meeting or, you know, let's circle back. I want to, I want to share a little bit more. Um, and then of course, uh, UW Health is a large organization with, you know, lots of resource allocation restrictions and budget things and uh, chains of command. And so even if we have a great idea, it's got to go somewhere, get discussed, get finalized, get approved, get funded. And so some things take a while and I want to give people, um, a little bit of a heads up that it's not just going to happen at the moment that an idea is brought up. So those are just some ways to set expectations that I've used. Um, and at the end of this, you know, we can have an open Q&A session. I'd love to hear um, anything that you guys are doing to set expectations with advisors. Um, I also want patient family advisors to kind of walk away with the sense, um, you know, if they don't have it already, that they're going to learn a lot and gain a lot from being an advisor. So um, I asked this question, how will you benefit from serving as a patient family advisor? And I offer some options. So some people say that they um, gain satisfaction by helping others, um, improving processes and so on. And some people love learning and they come here to figure out how, how this sort of complex health system works. Um, some people enjoy the, the contact with staff and um, providers that you know, they can kind of get the behind the scenes peek at what's happening in their healthcare system. Um, and then of course, others enjoy really connecting with other patient family advisors and learning from their experiences. So by asking this question, what's your personal benefit? Um, I usually say like, you know, what are your top one or two drivers? And then they can kind of reflect on what's bringing them um, to volunteer. And it's another chance to see if there's anything out of alignment with their reason for coming, um, or if they want to explore different opportunities, um, we can, um, you know, point them towards the volunteer services department or something else if they're, if they're like, oh, this, none of this captures what I want. Um, we can definitely try to find them a fit in the organization. But generally, I would say if I had to guess, people would um, almost always say, number one, that they want to just help out. And it's because they've experienced their own care um, and they want to make sure that other people have either a similarly positive experience or an improved experience from the one that they had.
Um, so we also, right in orientation, um, talk about confidentiality as a um, requirement for participating. We like to keep all, comp all topics confidential um, and especially health information um, that they might be exposed to. Uh, the reason for this, of course, is it allows us to really open up to our patient family advisors and um, have open discussions with them to help make um, the right kinds of decisions. We don't need to, um, you know, screen or, or sort of withhold information from them. And obviously, the nature of health information is protected and private um, all the time. And clearly describing that patient family advisors should not um, discuss unfinished business, they shouldn't access or release patient information, and that all of it, even if they just hear it or see it or, um, you know, sort of passively exposed to health information, that it's all confidential. And I always like to say that's polite, but it's also the law. So we have to follow um, the HIPAA laws, so Health, Insur health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. I'm sure everyone listening knows all about that. And I do try to describe that with them and define what PHI is and kind of the rules around that, that everyone follows. And it also reassures them that it will protect their health information as well. Um, another layer of this is that, um, of course, with this day and age, we've got lots of social me people so active on social media. And I like to clarify that they, um, both staff and volunteers, are not allowed to share photos of patients, even if it's um, they're incidentally in the frame. And that if they have a social media account that is connected to UW Health, like if they say, I'm, I'm a volunteer at UW Health, um, that they have to use a disclaimer that says the views presented are um, theirs and not that of UW Health. So usually people at that point are like, oh, I don't use social media or I'm not going to do that. And I think it's wise just to disconnect those things myself. But we do have a policy that um, is enforced for both staff and for volunteers. And the last little bit of responsibility here that I like to share with advisors is to let us know about conflicts of interest. So anytime when um, an advisor may have um, an interest that could compete with another one, whether it's uh, a way to benefit from or profit from their involvement as the patient family advisor, we would like to know that. Um, it doesn't necessarily exclude them. We'll I'll get some eyes on it and make sure that it's, um, you know, verify whether it's a conflict or not. Um, and so some examples of that is if they work for another healthcare organization or um, maybe someone that we're considering hiring as a contractor or to do a, a facilities um, improvement or a building job, or if they have a personal connection or conflict with a staff member. So I just kind of bring that up. Um, we have had a couple people who've had to exit the program because um, of jobs that they took. Um, and that wasn't necessarily a problem, but it was just something that we had to we had to be aware of, and then that means that they couldn't serve on the role that they wanted, but they could serve on other roles that had less um, exposure to information. All right, and we're still in my orientation deck, so this is still some more things that I um, ask of patient family advisors, is to let us know if they, um, you know, if they, of course, if they change their email or address, but also to keep us in the loop about how, how it's going on their projects. Um, sometimes even a project is, wrapping up and, and they're ready for a new assignment. So I'd like to know that ahead of time. I'll find out eventually, but if they let me know first, then I can get them started on something new. And sometimes maybe things aren't going as well as they want or it's not a good fit for them or their schedule changes and just love to have some feedback so that people don't just drop off the map. And we wanna keep, um, keep the program moving. So the more communication, the better. And I try to be super responsive to any and all communication from patient family advisors because I really value that connection. Okay, so that's kind of my, my orientation deck in a nutshell. Um, during orientation, we also take a minute to um, match the patient family advisor to an opportunity of their interest. We have um, five major things that I focus on and I did go over these in detail at the last webinar, so I won't today but uh, we have about 12 patient family advisory councils. Um, like I said, about 80 to 100 other activities, including committees, work groups, focus groups. Some of those are uh, long-term, like they meet every, um, you know, every month for infinitely. Uh, also, and some of them are short-term, like six months to a year, and focus groups are usually one-time events. We do um, some surveys and some contributions um, by computer, which we call e-advising. We have a variety of um, more active volunteer assignments that we call PFAs on assignment. So that would be things like um, 
our communication advisor program where we shadow residents and give them feedback on communication or um, observing in a waiting room or rounding on patients or doing staff training. So we have some more in-depth assignments that we can um, develop people for. And then the last thing there is our public speaking program where we um, help people get prepared to speak in front of groups or um, even create like um, social media posts that we'll use to train or share with staff some important messages. So all of those things, we kind of go over um, uh, all of the options and I get a little sense at orientation about what is um, maybe a good match for them. Um, and then usually they, most people end up walking out of orientation with at least one assignment to a council. I think it's good to have people set up in a, an advisory council because they meet regularly. They um, include other patient family advisors. They're very structured. Um, they are, the facilitators are well versed in how to work with patient family advisors and it's kind of a safe environment for them. When people start working in committees and work groups, sometimes the staff um, are more or less experienced working with patient family advisors, and those experiences can be, um, they have to kind of be able to be, stand on their own two feet more, it's a little more independent, um, and they can feel a little isolated if they're the only PFA in a committee. So I really do want people to start off in an advisory council, and so I'll try to find a fit for there, um, and if not, we'll, uh, try to my best to get them set up with something that I think is meaningful and will keep them engaged. So once the patient family advisor is in our system, um, I do send out um, emails to notify them of new opportunities. So what you see here is um, the kind of the bare bones categories of information that I would ask for when someone requests a patient family advisor for their opportunity. So I'll do a brief description or a title um, of the activity. So in this case, we're looking at the falls prevention work group. And I always collect a purpose. Um, in this case, uh, coordinating multiple projects uh, aimed at reducing falls in hospital setting includes patient education, staff education, um, and best practices. And then each um, opportunity has a type. In this case, standing committee, which means it meets regularly over time. There's no end date ongoing. Um, and the exact schedule and location. That way people can decide if it you know, meets their scheduling needs and their ability to, to um, commute there and how many openings I have. And then um, if there's any specific recruitment, um, like any profile description that we want, I'll list that there. This one's pretty general, so it's kind of a basic um, PFA opportunity listing. And I would use this basic information to send out to our group and see who's interested and start to narrow down the list of candidates. So I just want to look at some of the other types of information that might fit into these um, listings. Um, so in the type, I kind of, I have several different types of activities that I categorize. So we have facility design, which would be working on um, an improvement or a new facility. So that would be like selecting materials for chairs or looking at art or designing um, like the layout of a building. We have lots of work going on in that area. Improvement work groups usually focus on improving processes or, um, you know, doing like a, I don't know, like a, um, a value stream mapping activity or something like that where it's a, usually short term, but it's focused on improving a certain process. PFAC is Patient Family Advisory Council. That's the group that meets regularly to talk about a certain topic. Um, and there's, like I said, 12 of those. PFA is an assignment. Um, again, those volunteer assignments. Standing committee meets regularly. And voices is the speaking program. So I kind of um, divide some of those categories that you saw earlier into further divisions just to give myself a sense of what's happening. This really helps with um, end of year reporting so I can filter by all those groups and just see all the different kinds of standing committees that you had, all the voices of UW Health assignments um, that were filled. And then I re prepare a report, which I'll show you later, that shows some of the outcomes of those. So um, you can't see it here, but in my humongous spreadsheet that includes all this information, there is a column for outcomes, and I track all that. And I also track the, who the staff liaison is and their contact information, who the actual advisors are who got assigned, and so on. So this is just part of it, because. Um, you know, PowerPoint has its limitations for size of things you can show on there. 
Um, term, I usually uh, think about it as a one-time opportunity ongoing, which means there's no end date or short term. And short term could be like, you know, three to six months at three meetings, who knows? Um, it just kind of has a shorter term and I do list that out more in the commitment. Uh, as far as recruitment, here's where we can get a little bit more detailed. So sometimes the recruitment notes include really specific descriptions of what kind of advisor would fit the role. Um, in this case, this was, um, we were looking for a parent or primary support person of a child who had been hospitalized at American Family Children's Hospital Pediatric Intensive Care Unit who had had experience with the rounds there. And we found one person who met that description. So, you know, they needed someone who experienced those rounds and uh, we got one and I was pretty surprised. Sometimes if you narrow the pool so so small, it's really hard to find people who fit the role. Um, so I'll ask at the point of taking the information from the staff person, like, if we can't get that, would you, you know, would you accept someone who had another like general kind of experience with the children's hospital or whatever? So I'll try to get like different levels of um, recruitment notes. Here's some more examples. Um, in this one, looking for a patient or family member who had been discharged to a skilled nursing facility a short period of time to recover after a procedure and a Medicare beneficiary. So you can imagine this was an improvement group on trying to improve um, readmission rates. Um, and so we wanted someone who'd kind of been there and we found someone. So I was really surprised about that too. Uh, sometimes it's really about whether, um, what kind of clearance they have. In our case, we call patient contact is called level three clearance because they have to have um, a number of health uh, assessments and clearances done, including a background check and um, some training for safety infection control. But um, if we need people who need patient contact um, clearance, I'll put level three. And I think the last one here is we were looking for someone who had had experience with the parking ramp. And I like how the, the staff person who wrote this um, actually also asked for someone with an optimistic spirit who's willing to share ideas and collaborate on changes. And it really kind of gave um, uh, a sense of what the work group, what the work group would be like. Um, and of course, who doesn't want to help improve uh, parking at University Hospital? If you've ever been there, uh, it's a fun job. So, um, and this, uh, yeah, we did find someone who also had had um, like improvement work experience at another organization. So. You know, the more descriptive you can be, maybe the better the match, but it could also limit the number of people available. Okay. Oh, here's one. I'm sorry. This is the last one. So uh, in this case, we were looking for people who had had experience coping with opioids or addiction, um, whether for themselves or for a family member, and that they would be willing to make a difference. And the person who got recruited for this actually helped develop our recovery coach program um, and was really instrumental in that effort. All right, enough of that. So um, when I when I have all that information assembled, it, it kind of comes out in this um, sort of horizontal display, and I send an email that has some welcoming um, text that says, "Hey, we need your help. Let me know if this is a good match for you," and then um, all that information that I shared with you. And of course, as I said, this in, this information lives in a much larger spreadsheet, so I will um, kind of hide columns as needed and just select the information that I want to share with the advisors. Um, I'll also say that I, I don't send out every opportunity to every patient family advisor because then many, um, maybe, maybe more people would want to do it than I would have opportunities for. So I might select those eligible to participate. So if I know that, um, for example, we're looking at um, prenatal, this week I'm trying to recruit for something about prenatal, um, intake phone call scripting. So I'm not gonna ask everyone, I'm just gonna ask maybe um, you know, women who had received prenatal care. So then I'll just select all the women in my list and not even send it to the men because they wouldn't be eligible anyway. So I'll kind of like pick and choose who I send them to. And again, that sorting feature in Excel is um, really helpful to kind of create the right email list. Can't say enough about that. Okay. All right, so that was um, the placement um, section. And now we're gonna transition into retention. So um, keeping, you know, placing good PFAs 
um, and getting them set up for success is one thing, but you have to keep them as well. So um, I've done a lot of research with my patient family advisors on what it what it takes to keep them. So, um, and this is from them. So they they want to know that their interests align with our needs, um, and they want to be engaged in the the process. They appreciate frequent check-ins. Um, they really do want a welcoming social atmosphere. So things like name tense, introductions, um, time to have some small talk before a meeting help tremendously in keeping people uh, personally connected to the work, coming back, um, excited to you know, to kind of come back and see their friends again. And I really encourage any staff working with patient family advisors to not neglect that part. It may seem extra to us, um, you know, you have a meeting, you have an agenda, we don't have time for this, but it's so critical for them. Um, and they've told me that time and time again, so sharing that with you all. Um, they do like the variety of opportunities. Um, and then of course, and most importantly, they wanna hear that what they've done has made a difference. So they love updates and outcomes of the projects that they've been involved in. So those are some of the tips that they shared with me. I also asked them um, in a meeting once, a large meeting, about 100 people, what do you like about the PFA program? And I said, please write one word. And then I made a word cloud from their one word answers. And the larger words are the ones that were repeated more often among the 100 responses. So you can see that they, they just love being involved. They love variety. They love um, contributing. They like hearing other people's stories, the opportunity to um, make an impact, and the partnership that they have with us. So hearing directly from them, like what, what they like about it, um, helps me create the right kind of programming so that I can keep my um, advisors coming back. I also um, ask patient family advisors once a year, I do an annual engagement survey. And these questions um, were written, again, by patient family advisors asking, um, you know, what's important to you as an advisor. And um, they want to know, they want to feel welcomed and respected. They want to know that the role is clear, that there was enough time for PFA input, and that they, um, they want to be prepared. So um, I surveyed this annually, and I'll show you my 2018 results. And it's a little small, but you can see that, um, so the purple at the top is NA, so they didn't answer, but uh, or they didn't have an opinion about that. But five is the orange zone. So five is uh, strongly agree. So there's a larger orange zone or larger strongly agree with I felt welcomed and respected than, for example, I felt prepared for my role. So knowing this um, and kind of looking at all of the distribution of those answers, um, I threw this back to the staff and I said, so seeing this, what would you change about how you work with our patient family advisors? Um, I say they're doing a great job, welcoming, respecting, um, but maybe just being really clear about expectations. Like what do you want from, what kind of, a, what kind of um, contribution would be appropriate from a PFA? Um, really setting the stage, asking direct questions. Um, sometimes I've, I've gone into meetings as an observer and I'll see staff um, share their project and then say something really general like what do you guys think and it doesn't really elicit the kind of um, specific answer that patient family advisors should give and maybe if they were if the question were prepared more appropriately they would answer better so of course if you ask someone what do you think they're going to say it's great but if you ask them more specifically like how would this affect you or if you could change this in one way what would it be or you know something like super specific um, then they can feel like they're they know that their contribution is um, landing well and is being you know appropriately contributing to the project. So that I you know I try to get that from uh, PFAs every year and then again share the outcomes with staff so they can act on it. Um, I also ask this question: Why do you participate in the PFA program? And again, knowing this helps us create the right kind of programming. Um, or adjust expectations or whatever it is. Um, so we know that people like to share their stories, help others. Um, you know, the, the ability to share patient um, viewpoint and input, they know that it helps with um, their patient experience. They know it makes a difference. So they wanna know that it makes a difference, right? So we have to make sure we send back those outcome statements to them so that they can feel like it's working. 
So these are just some of the ways that if, you, if you're starting up a PFA program, if, you're, if you already have a good cohort of advisors, um, you know, consider asking these kinds of questions so you can send the answers back to staff and then they can create the right kinds of opportunities. So that people are, um, you know, continually involved and retained. All right, so my next little section um, is about recognition. Um, so, of course, we have to celebrate all this good work that we do, and um, we, part of our celebration every year includes a booklet that um, shares the outcome um, and appreciation from the organization, um, because, again, PFAs love to know that they're making a difference. So, here are some of the um, covers of the um, booklets that we've made. A lot of these are were distributed at the appreciation dinner historically, so you'll see some reference to that. So this was 2014, 2015. So these were inside, I'll show you an example of what it looks like inside, but these are just the covers. And by the way, we have an amazing um, graphic arts team at our marketing department, and they're really helpful in creating these for us. That was 2016. 2017, that one we had Bucky Badger come and it was super fun. And we gave away tickets to homecoming a football game. That was fun. Um, and then this last year we focused on, um, we had the theme connecting to purpose. So I'll open up this one for you so you can kind of see what it's um, about. So we um, ha collect as many thank yous as possible, as many as I can fit. I can usually fit about 50 or so of these little paragraphs inside. Um, so this one is a, I try to categorize them again by um, topic area, just so it's not so random. And we ask staff to format their, their letters of gratitude with the purpose, um, who contributed, and the outcome. So I try to, I give them examples, I tell them the format, and then I get really consistent results back. Um, so this one, for example, says the input from the UW Health PFAC was invaluable defining what it looks like for patients and families when staff work together. We knew from patient survey feedback that working together was vitally important to patients' experience, but needed concrete and actionable examples to share with providers and staff. The UW Health and AFCHP facts provided those real-life examples, which have been shared across the organization in the Five Ways to Work Together guide, as well as in the patient and family experience training and presentations. The patient family advisors' insights and perspective were essential to this project, I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity to learn from them. So that, um, this project that she's referencing did really impact the whole organization and is um, the document Five Ways to Work Together is continually referenced in our trainings and in our, um, our work as patient family experience department. Um, and so then they know that those examples that they generated in the meeting ended up, you know, really going uh, wide and having a lot of impact. So that's just one of the 50 examples. I try to highlight the group that was um, contributing, and sometimes it's an individual, um, and so we'll highlight them in bold. Um, and then here's the layout of that booklet. I'm in the middle of that picture, if you guys are wondering. Um, and then, so we have lots of uh, thank yous here over many pages. And then at the end, um, summarizing the key initiatives of our advisory councils. Of course, they did much more than the year that I can list, but I ask each um, co-chair to give me three, three top things that they want to celebrate and share with the organization that they did. So then we can, um, you know, kind of celebrate at the end of the year and um, the organiz organization and the patient family advisors have an idea about what kinds of great work that we involve patients in. So we have that booklet. Um, Ash also annually, we usually give away um, some gifts. And so last year we gave that, that fantastic coffee mug away and uh, maybe an umbrella next year. I'm not sure, we'll see. Um, and so, you know, we have these things and we give them away and we thank people and we've done this in two ways. So we've done it at a dinner where we had a formal speaking program, some networking activities, some raffles, you know, kind of a fun celebration. And we've also done it where we just bring the, um, the items and some activities to do at the PFAC meetings where the patient family advisors are already there. So these two options um, both achieve the idea of recognition of patient family advisors and the work that they've done in partnership with staff. But there's a little bit of a difference. And so I 
kind of been going back and forth um, about these two things. And the structured program dinner has some um, features, like it's very visible. Um, the organization hears about it in our, like our intranet and people can um, view photos and we usually invite some high level leaders and that uh, increases our influence in the organization. Um, it does take many months of planning to organize a dinner for um, around 100 people with all those activities and things. Um, not too many advisors attend because we do allow guests. So typically um, about a quarter of our PSA group would come with a guest and then the remainder would be staff who work with them as um, participants in the um, dinner. So we're reaching a quarter of the um, advisors at a pretty high cost, although it's super fun. And like I said, there's Bucky Badger, very memorable event. Um, also, like I said, doing these things um, a little bit more low-key, but um, at their meetings, we'll bring the booklets, some gifts, we'll do an activity that is um, centering them on, um, you know, why they're, why we value them, why, why they're doing what they're doing, sharing some outcomes. These kinds of things that we do at their events that they're already attending are more accessible to them. Um, they're already going to a meeting, they don't have to go to another meeting generally more comfortable for them. Um, we've had some people say, I don't go to those dinners because I don't know anyone. I don't want to sit by myself and feel like I have to make small talk with people I don't know. And so we do have people maybe with some more, um, that's not, that's not their cup of tea to go to a big formal event. Um, of course, planning is simpler and we are able to reach almost all of the PFAs at a lower cost per PFA. So the reach is stronger um, and it's a little bit more cost effective. So that's um, what I have to say about that. I also, because I didn't want to disappoint people, I surveyed our PFAs about what they like. Um, before making any big decisions, you know, I always like to involve them as stakeholders in decisions that affect them. Hopefully that sounds familiar. And I looked at whether they like the dinner or whether they like the, um, sorry, whether they like the recognition at their meetings or what other things that they like. And so the number one thing that they wanted was just appreciation from staff that they worked with about the work that they had done. So that got about 71% of uh, responses. People enjoyed that. And then you can see that whether it's at the dinner or whether it's at the PFAC meeting was a pretty even split. Um, not a strong preference either way. So I think they don't really care too much about the venue. It's more about hearing that their work is appreciated. Um, so that's just how, you know, when I surveyed my group, what I got, um, and I didn't see a really strong preference for, uh, we need to have these big dinners. I also had asked a couple years ago, like, um, what kinds of, what kinds of events that they like? I asked, do you like large social events, smaller scale, formal events, or casual? And there's an overwhelming preference for smaller scale and casual events than large and formal. And the reason I bring this up is because when we first started this program, the first dinner was super formal um, and large. And I think that that was intimidating to people and we didn't ask them ahead of time what they wanted. And I think we misstepped a little bit back in the day when we thought, well, we're gonna make this big splash about PFA recognition. We wanna make it a big deal. And they really didn't want that. And so I'm glad that um, you know now we've kind of hit our stride and we know what fits for this group. And they kind of have said loud and clear that they would prefer just something low, low key, nothing stressful, smaller scale, casual events. So I think it's good not to make assumptions about what they want, because I learned a lot by just doing the survey. Very eye opening. Um, I also asked about different kinds of um, recognition preferences. Some people like the gift, some don't. Um, my favorite comment was, um, I do like the gift, my wife sometimes takes them from me. That makes me chuckle every time. So apparently they're valued. Some people not so much. Um, everyone likes the words of gratitude. Um, we'll keep that coming for sure. And looking at, um, some people said, you know what, I love the idea of getting together, but not for the purpose of recognition. I just wanna meet more people like me who are patient family advisors. So some people said, you know, I don't really need to do this recognition thing, but I would love to get together. Um, maybe we could do some more learning together or we could attend some, um, you know, baseball game together or something social that isn't formal. 
Um, so I'll, I'll be thinking about that for coming years, like how we can, um, you know, create those kinds of opportunities. And then some people said, you know what, I'm not here for recognition, I just want to help. And I think that's fantastic too. And then one more on these, um, again, in that same meeting, I asked, you know, what's the best way to show appreciation? And out of 100 people, um, the word cloud came out that just simple thanks is enough, uh, followed by implementation um, results. And then a little bit about food <laughs> and uh, there's money in there somewhere. I think that was a joke. I'm not sure. But yeah, so it's good just to ask directly what the advisors um, appreciate in their um, about, you know, working together and how they want to be recognized in their contributions. Okay, so we zoomed through um, the orientation and placement. We looked quickly at um, ways to retain patient family advisors, at least in my experience, um, and then some recognition options. But I would love to hear from all of you, like any of your um, strategies that you have um, for, you know, anything on here, orientation, placement, retention, or recognition. If you wouldn't mind contributing or asking questions, um, we have plenty of time for that. Don't be shy. And as a reminder, you are on mute. So if you do want to speak, um, go down to the lower left-hand side and click on the mic icon or um, submit something through the chat box. You know, and I, I also encourage you guys, if you want to reach out to me individually, like, feel free. I love to network and learn from other people doing the same similar work. Or if you're in the phase of starting up a patient family advisor program, I'm happy to help share any insights that I've learned. But, um, you know, I'd love to learn from you guys as well. the last call for any comments or questions. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. And as a reminder, today's recording will be available in the Quality Center. And we hope to have you join us again on September 10th and November 12th for the rest of our patient family engagement webinar series. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Jenna. Yeah, thank you. And have a great rest of your week. Thank you.